Hello, a very, very warm welcome to episode 35 of the Gita Decoded. This is a series in which Sister Denise and I are going through every single chapter of the Bhagavad Gita to try and understand the true meaning and the message that God intended for Arjuna. This topic is entitled Chapter 9, Yoga of Royal Knowledge and of Royal Mystery. Sister Denise, it's great to see you again. Thank you. Chapter 9 begins on, on the note that knowledge and realization releases oneself from evil. Could you explain this? Well, evil is said to come from ignorance. So the most important thing is to understand what is ignorance and move away from it. But ignorance is called darkness. And so the light of knowledge is brought to bear on the darkness of ignorance, which means ignorance doesn't mean that you don't know something, but rather that what you, what you know, what you think you know, is actually not right. And so God comes and gives you the right information, and which then throws light on the subject, and you then are not are going to perform negative karma because where there is ignorance you will perform negative karma. Sure. Sister Denise, I think very few people don't get the link between the two. Ignorance, negative karma and your own sorrow. I think we make the mistake of not joining those dots. Well, I think we do make that mistake and uh, this is why the Gita is so valuable for us because it says, look, if you carry on like this, this is what's going to be the consequence. Now, do you really want to do that? Okay, I'd like to take you through the rest of what is contained in verse 1. The Blessed Lord spoke, but this most secret thing I shall declare to you who do not disbelieve. I find those words interesting. I shall declare to you who do not disbelieve. Explain the role that faith has in this context. If you have faith that the one who's speaking to you is God, then you will pay attention to what is being said. But if you think this is not God, then you will dismiss what's being said without even listening. Mm -hmm. So faith, um, a recognition, if you recognize God, this is God talking to you. So therefore, because it's such a great personality, God, is telling you something, you must pay full, full attention. Mm -hmm. And then you have to accept it. But why would you not accept it? Is because it goes against your ignorance. Your ignorance, you will say, you hold this to be true, and then God says, well, actually, it's not true. So you have to give up the ignorance and take on the knowledge which you have to do with a lot of faith because uh, you have a resistance to doing it because you had faith in that that ignorance was not ignorance. Yeah, that is very complex. It's simple to understand, but we've got ourselves into quite a mess, haven't we? Humanity. Well, yes, yeah. But this is why it takes, you know, in a way, it takes a whole lifetime or maybe even several lifetimes. The Gita, if you think about it, the Gita's been there for centuries and you've been reincarnating, so you must have been studying it for a while. Right. <laughs> but this is not uh, the only um, Gita decoded episode that I've done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sister Denise, I want to take you to verse number two, which reads, This is royal knowledge, a royal secret, a supreme purifier, plainly intelligible, righteous, easy to practice, imperishable. Why is this a most secret thing? Um, obviously, what God says to Arjuna is the truth. Okay, and in my part of the, in my profession, we say the truth is the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Okay, why is truth a secret? I think truth is a secret because you don't get it. You're told it many, many times, but it just doesn't get through your thick head, um, there's a lot of resistance to it uh, unless you can 
grasp it because it's so subtle also. Um, you have to be of that group of people who are able to apprehend it and apply it. And that's said earlier to be a very, very few, uh, very small group of people. And you see, where it says here royal knowledge, the Sanskrit is Raj Vidya. Now, Raj Vidya is politics, you see. And so the king needs to understand the science and art of politics because you have to rule the kingdom. And how to rule the kingdom as an enlightened being, a, a, a subtle Pradhan king or emperor, uh, that is, we don't have that much precedent for that in the world as we know it. So this is out of range, so secret in the sense that um, this is beyond your normal range. You know, it is said for God, God creates the kingdom of heaven. Mm. It's not the democracy of heaven or the tyranny of heaven or the military junta of heaven. There's a lot of different systems of government and heaven is called the kingdom. So you have Raj Vidya, the, the divine knowledge of how to run a kingdom. And this is, this is what we've got next. Uh, verse 4 reads, this whole universe is pervaded by me, capital M, in my, capital M, unmanifest aspect. All beings abide in me, I do not abide in them. And then moving on to verse 5, and yet beings do not abide in me. Uh, what does this mean? It's a contradiction. Mm, yeah, I'd like you to explain the paradox. If you say God is someone, somewhere, his reach is unlimited. Uh, you don't have to actually be physically be in all places in order to reach all places. So I would definitely interpret it that way, that God is somewhere in particular, but uh, knows about the entire universe, the whole cycle of things, and um, all the beings, all the souls, and all of their destinies and fates and everything, uh, they are also known to God. So God would um, be aware of everyone, everywhere. And uh, yet it is difficult for people to comprehend that there could be someone who could have a reach which is so extensive without actually being everywhere. So I think the idea of um, the omnipresence of God is connected with this uh, assumption that you cannot have a reach that is everywhere without being everywhere. But I would say that you can have a, a reach that reaches everywhere without actually being everywhere. The rest of verse 5 interests me as well, Sister Denise. Behold my divine yoga, sustaining beings and not dwelling in beings, is my self, two words, myself with capital S, causing beings to be. Mm. My understanding of this is that God is saying, this is how I look after you. And he's revealing one of his um, well, primary responsibilities towards mankind. How do you understand it? Well, here we're talking about God sustaining. And you know that uh, traditionally the sustainer is called Vishnu. Mm. And so Vishnu, the sustainer, is one of the instruments of God. So God will work through Vishnu to sustain uh, the people, the world, and so on. Uh, where you have the word my and self separate and the word self capitalized, um, one thing that you can consider is that the self, the higher self of the yogi, is being used as an instrument for God to sustain the world which is to come. Uh, but God also, you know, continues to emanate energy. And um, the thing is, unless people can connect with God, they're not going to be able to take that energy. Mm -hmm. 
So in the Raj Yoga that we practice in, in Brahma Kumaris, we talk about it like this, that it's only at this time when God reveals himself that we can actually uh, be in connection. And in the previous uh, verse, the second verse, it talks about the knowledge as imperishable, which I think is a very important one. The knowledge is imperishable, that means it, w it won't disappear. Um, but you may forget it, uh, and yet it is always there, and um, you can remember it again. Mm. So sometimes you forget, sometimes you remember. So, Sir Denise, that line, sustaining beings and not dwelling in beings, does that not shoot the belief of omnipresent to pieces? Well, I think it does. I yeah. think it does. That's a big bullet, isn't it? It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think it's again connected with the idea that people find it very hard to conceptualize a being who is there uh, as a point source in the Brahmand and whose reach is throughout the universe, throughout the earth, throughout time able to know independently of things happening. See, because God is the creator and he knows the creation. Mm -hmm. And uh, traditionally it is said that even the great rishis and munis had said that they cannot say uh, about the creator and the creation. Only God, the creator, can explain the creation. So he will know the creation from its inception to its dissolution, mm. independently of individual events. Now, a human soul knows things as they occur, because you can experience something only through your sense perception, whereas the God soul knows things without sense perception. So you know it before it's happened and after it's happened and there's no difference to you before or after or during because you know the whole thing. So this is outside of the range of most people's thinking. But I think that once God opens up your intellect and describes carefully exactly how he is, then you can then grasp it because he has enabled you to grasp it. Sister Denise, I do find on page 6 that line, so all beings dwell in me, um, in a sense comforting, because he's saying, although I'm not physically present in you, in other words, I'm not omnipresent, you live in my heart because yes. you're my child. It's what I was saying earlier. This is one of those heart points. Yes. Okay. This is very comforting mm. to know that uh, irrespective of who you are, what you've done, etc., you live in God's heart. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. What else do you need if you live in God's heart? What's wrong? Yeah. And, and look at the way this verse ends. Consider this, exclamation mark. Mm. Consider it. Apply your mind to it. Something to meditate on. Yeah. Yes, well, one can actually sit and meditate on this line alone in the whole book and you will achieve what God is asking us to achieve. You will. Mm. Consider this. Okay, I invite you to consider this. <laughs> so, Sister Denise, let's move on to verse 7. All beings, Arjuna, go to my own material nature. At the end of a kalpa, at the beginning of the kalpa, I send them forth. Okay, that is extremely interesting to me because um, God is known as the creator and paradoxically um, he cannot create that which is eternal and yet he has a role to play in the appearance of beings on earth and thereafter. He has a role which is clearly enunciated in verse 7 in chapter 9. Mm -hmm. How do you <coughs> understand this um, You know, where the translation says material nature, in the Sanskrit, uh, Sanskrit is speaking about prakriti. Mm -hmm. And prakriti means matter. Mm -hmm. um, so not necessarily material nature, but just matter. So souls, God will bring souls away from matter and send them back into matter. 
And so I would interpret it a little bit more like that. Now, uh, in this verse, there is the word kalpa. And the kalpa refers to the cycle. And uh, within the kalpa, there are the yugas, the different ages. And so this is where I think the um, point about the time when the Gita is spoken is relevant, because he's talking about the whole kalpa with all the ages included in it. So it's really the cusp between the kalpas, between the cycles, that the beings return to God in the Brahman, in the world of light. And then, at the beginning of the kalpa, which is the golden age, the satyuga, then the souls are sent to earth one by one, according to their destiny, according to their strength, you see. And so I would interpret it like that. If you go further to the next verse, my own material nature. Actually, he doesn't have a material nature. He has a non-material nature. Yeah, you can't say God has an immaterial nature now, can you? <laughs> no, you can't. But he's incorporeal. Mm. He's incorporeal, and so he sends all the souls to the world. You know, it, it speaks about um, it not having power by the power of my material nature. I, I think what we need to um, consider here is on the one hand, there is what God decides to say and do. And on the other hand, you have fate, you have destiny, you have the predestined drama, which we learn about a lot in the Brahma Kumaris. So God uh, would say, I do not have any power over what is destined, but I know what it is, so I can explain it to you, but I'm not going to change it because it is like that. I'm now going to move on to verse number 8 which reads, and these actions do not bind me, Arjuna, I sit indifferently, unattached to these actions. So, um, this is describing God's role? Well, yeah, this is the shloka number nine. Um, when God does something, God is called akarta. So, akarta means one who doesn't act, or you can also say God does act, but there is no karmic bondage. So I think what he's saying is here is God uh, doesn't sort of pick and choose a few souls to just send them down by his choice, no, but presides over the universe and knows, okay, these souls are going to go down, but everybody feels that, you know, a person is sent to the earth by God. But you can also just as well say, a person will come when it's their time. So whether God physically sends them down or just knows about it, I think it, it doesn't involve God doing a, the act of sending somebody down, but just presiding over as they come down. And this is why it also says, I sit indifferently. Mm. So Denise, I need to ask you something at just th at this juncture. Um, one of the titles of God is the Sun. Sun, which is um, well, the closest equivalent that we have is the physical Sun. The Sun doesn't do anything; it right. just is. And yet, uh, the world cannot operate without the Sun. And I mean, imagine plants without pr photosynthesis. It, I mean, there would be no life without the sun. So, how come it's so difficult for us to understand the difference between being and doing? Wh why are we so stuck in action? Why uh, can human beings simply not understand? Here's the soul who sits in his abode and radiates, and his presence is um, what makes the hands of time tick. Partly, I think, it's because of our sense of what's valuable. When a person does a certain work, he gets paid for that work. Mm. And so the action, the karma of working, produces an income. Um, it is also said for yoga, 
that if you sit in yoga with good, you get an income, which is helpful because when you're sitting in yoga, you're not really doing anything. You're communing with God. You're being like the plant who's getting photosynthesis happening, which is really very good with the sun. Uh, but yet people are so action conscious, you know. You have body consciousness, you have action consciousness. It's very difficult for a person to justify just sitting there being. Uh, this world doesn't like such things. So I think it's, it's partly that uh, a person is um, also very deeply motivated to do something to improve themselves. Mm. whether it's financially or academically or whatever way, but um, I, th I think it's really part of the human nature. Mm. And what we're learning here is to put aside all that because we have to pay attention on our being. And that's where yoga comes in. You sit in yoga and you practice being. Okay, the last question I have for you is contained in verse 10, which reads, With me as overseer, material nature, which you just described as matter, produces all things animate and inanimate. Overseer. That is a very curious way to describe God's role. I am the overseer. I don't think it's so curious. There is God uh, sitting in his region, having set everything in motion, he will watch over it. And what it says is that the things happen automatically by the power of nature, you see. Hmm. Um, be beings get generated, they continue, they die, they regenerate. All of this is an automatic process. So, Sister Denise, from the way I understood that stanza, with me as overseer, comma, material nature produces all things animate and inanimate. The energy of nature is, um, is it's like a machine, mm. you know, the world uh, uh, functions. You have your, um, your nervous system, what is it, the autonomic system and the non-autonomic system. You don't have to think about breathing, you just breathe. Mm. You don't have to tell your blood to go around its uh, veins and everything. There are things that happen automatically, cycles that flow, your, your blood, um, uh, the cycle of blood, the, uh, your hair grows, your skin regenerates itself. This is all done by the power of nature. You don't need consciousness for that, you know. And it happens on the level of inanimate nature as well as the bodies of the people and creatures who inhabit those bodies. And, and uh, none of that requires God and none of that requires consciousness. Mm. And it's quite interesting um, that we have this uh, being described here as just the energy of nature, the energy of Prakruti, because this is what science says okay, this is all happening by itself, it doesn't need God, and therefore there is no God, you see. So science is just looking at what's happening in the material world, but it can't explain consciousness, and it can't explain this, um, you know, desire to become one with God who is beyond um, matter and beyond the humans. So. It has its limited function, but here we're looking at the function of God where there are times when he gets everything into motion, which is what the Gita is all about. God arrives, purifies, informs, educates, does everything, and then lets everything run, you see. So he is, like you can say, creator means regenerator, brings everything back to the factory settings, if you will, and then as a detached observer uh, watches it run until time comes again, which is also mentioned in the earlier chapters, whenever everything gets totally out of order, I come again and I bring it back to order. So this is a cyclical process. So God has to do this every so often, every time the Kalpa rotates, 
God will do this. Okay, Sister Denise, we have come to the end of today's episode, so we'll have to stop there. Uh, I hope you have found this show to be very informative, enlightening, and I trust that you've seen uh, this chapter in a way that you have never seen before because Sister Denise has a way of looking at things that is refreshingly different and unusual. So Sister Denise, thank you so much for what you've shared today. You. And you at home, I hope that you can take something in this episode uh, that is of value to you and practice it in your life and ask yourself the question, what is God's role in humanity? And more specifically, what is God's role in my life? personal. It's a very personal question. Um, I thank you for joining us this half an hour and I hope to see you soon for the next episode. Take care and we hope to see you soon. Goodbye. <laughs>